Hi, I'm Mark Cullen, and welcome to Wheel and Cullen Nurseries. I'm delighted that you picked up a copy of this tape, one in the complete Gardner series. In this volume, Dan Matheson from Canada AM joins me as we walk through the garden and talk about color and design, flowering bulb varieties that provide all kinds of color, harvesting flowers from the garden at the right time of year and the right time of day, gardening for shade, and gardening for color in the fall, plus the fundamentals of landscape design. So sit back and relax, and if you'd like more information, be sure, of course, to refer to the book that came with this videotape. And above all, have fun. Year after year, they come back without any work at all. Wonderful, like old friends, Mark Cullen says. Uh, they just keep showing up at your doorstep. Um, Mark, good to see you again. Good Perennials to see you. today we're talking about. Yeah, and, in your uh, garden. In, in, in one of my beds here. And we've yep. got a few perennials, as you can see. We have a yep. couple up and down the fence here, but we're going to put in a few more. What are the, what are the hints here? What are the tips? That First we have of to all, know? let's take a look at some sun loving. Come on down here for a second, Dan. Some sun loving perennials. Uh, here's one that, that many viewers will know. It's an old fashioned English perennial. As you said, it comes back year after year called pinks or dianthus, perennial dianthus. And it's, um, it's like a carnation. You've, you know a carnation. It's very delicate, yes. Very very, but this is a, like a miniature carnation, dianthus. dianthus. Okay. Yep. Here's another one called obrigia. And uh, obrigia is spelled A-U, not O. Mm -hmm. it sounds like an O, but it's an A-U. Okay, obrigia, a nice ground cover, nice mounding plant for rockeries, again, for sunny spots. That's what we're talking about. That pencil and piece of paper, Sandy, <laughs> right? Get a paper, piece of paper and a pencil, and that helps you a lot. I'll tell you, this, this little plant here, I'm going to play a little riddle with you. Now, when you go to a high school dance, this is what you don't want to be. <laughs> Wallflower! That's right. That's right. Good for you. <laughs> I uh, went a free trip to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One way. Um, Dan, did you, had you ever seen a wallflower before? No, and I didn't know that. It's a little kind of orange, goldy orange color. It'll get quite high, actually. These will grow 24 to 30 inches in a nice sunny spot. Plant them in good sandy soil, well-drained soil. And that's true for just about all perennials. They really like to have well-drained soil around their roots. Don't let them sit in water, mm -hmm. except for something like a lily of the valley, which you oh, can't yeah. kill anyway. Likes the swamps. Yeah. This is um, eroticum. Repeat this after me. Eroticum? Is that what I said? Eroticum? <laughs> Gigantium? No, this is doronicum. It looks like a dandelion. Doronicum. All right. It looks like a dandelion, but it's not. And here's, here's one. You'll have a lot of fun with the name on this one. Saxifraga. You know what it's a member Saxifraga. of? Saxifraga. Yeah, it's a member of the <laughs> strawberry family. No kidding. Yeah. Does it get fruit? No. Well, oh. I guess it would, but I wouldn't. I don't know. Again, another, I don't know. <laughs> again, another little delicate flower. <laughs> really pretty. Yeah. Nice. And this one is self-propagating. It like a like like a strawberry. It makes these runners that go out, bar, 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 You know. Yeah. Like a bunny rabbit, right through your so garden. You might have to it control it. Takes a few it. years though. And here's one, of course, you can't forget. Once you've heard it, forget me, me not. not. Right. This is a perennial forget-me-not. It doesn't grow very high. It's not very aggressive. Loves the sun. And it only blooms for about two to three weeks. If you want it to bloom all summer, then you buy the annual forget-me-not, which you would purchase as a seed, like in a packet of seeds. Sow it in a nice sunny spot. Again, well-drained soil. Add some nice Canadian sphagnum peat moss. Helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Let's put them in the ground. All right, let's. We're going to do a little bit of planting right here. Um, we've prepared your soil again this year. Uh, and this is an annual rite of spring. You have to do this because soil depletes, you know. We had annuals in here last year. Remember yes, the begonias? Yeah, yes. They looked good, didn't they? Yes, they did. Yeah, but they're gone now. And, of course, they're gone for good because they're annuals. But perennials, as you mentioned, come back like old friends. So put a nice, generous layer of peat moss over the surface of the soil. This is nice, friable soil to begin with. You know that word? Am I in your way? Oh, I do know. No, yes. Actually, here, take I this. learned that from you. That means it falls apart in your hand. That's right. Sure, I'll <laughs> just turn I'll that get... over, all right? All right. Turn that over, and we'll plant a, we'll plant a uh, forget-me-not. We're going to slide it out of the pot. Make sure you do that. Just poke the bottom and uh, get the soil surface fairly even, and down you go. All right, just like so. And once again, I say this all the time, Dan, give it lots of oomph. Yes. Oomph. You okay? stomp them right in, don't you? We've got to take a look at a couple of perennials for the shade. Now, here's a spot in between a couple of rather large shrubs, and there's some trees up there, so we have lots of shade here. And Mark, we've worked this area already. I'll just uh, I'll do what you know the manual labor at the back here. With All right. Feet. All right. You still got the pencil and piece of paper. Mark down for shade hosta. 
And this is a family of over 160 different varieties of plants, absolutely gorgeous plants that grow from, oh gee, I don't know, about four inches high up to about three feet high, um, depending on the variety you choose. And they're very and, rich looking. Well, they are. And, and they're very insect and disease free, unless you have slugs, because slugs love hosta. Okay, and back here, Dan, can, just a sec, could I grab that? Sure. This is a stilby. Now, a stilby, excuse me just a minute, I'm speaking to you. A stilby's <laughs> got a, a gorgeous <laughs> flower that grows about so high, and the nice thing about this is that it flowers for about eight weeks every year. So it not only comes back like an old friend, but it flowers for a long period of time. Well, why don't you let too. me put that in this hole here, and you show the folks a couple of uh, little couple pots of wild flowers there. down here. A little blood root here, a little blood root, and of course, this, people in Ontario will know, as many other provinces, this grows beautifully, it's the trillium. And uh, you can get these nursery grown in the garden centers this time of year. Plant them in a shady spot with lots of leaf mold or compost around the root zone. Okay? Thank you again, Mark. Hi, well listen, we're back in my store at Wheel and & Cullen, and we're going to talk about, for the next few minutes, designing a landscape around your home. And you'll want a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper for this segment, because I'm going to move very quickly through some of the fundamentals of landscape design. And the first thing I'm going to suggest is that you take that pencil or the pen and piece of paper and make a list of the uses you wish to make of your yard space. The front yard should be one list, and the backyard should be another. Consider such things as a private place to perhaps read a book or some, for some privacy. A place perhaps to entertain out of the wind, consider that, or a place for a barbecue, a deck, or get this, if in your long range thinking you may like to put a swimming pool, put that on your list. It will de determine to a very large degree the kind of landscape that you're going to create for your yard, front or back. This is very important stuff. Do you want a lawn? Now, before you get to a question like, do you want a lawn or do you want flowering shrubs? Do you want a play area for the kids? I have to say, one of my own personal biases is that the best ground cover is a lawn. And that's really what it is, the most sophisticated ground cover known to man. It takes foot traffic and it takes a lot of abuse. So kids can be tolerated by a good lawn. Make sure you keep that on your list. Do you want to attract birds and wildlife to your yard? Add that to your list as well. Got the idea? Okay. Now you've got your list, let's talk a little bit about some of the very basic principles in landscape design and start with the most unusual thing of all in this ergonomic world that we live in, a square or rectangular shaped lot, okay? First thing that people almost always do or want to do is place a shade tree. If this is your lot and let's say this more or less is your house and a driveway, the placing of the shade tree is absolutely critical to the long-range plan because while everything else about your landscape can be changed fairly easily, flowering shrubs, evergreens, perennials, certainly annual flowers and vegetables, all those things can be moved around. The shade tree as it matures cannot. Let's just consider the fact that it probably cannot. Now, the first thing you should not do is put it right in the middle of the yard because if you do that, you effectively cut the yard in half you've eliminated play area or open space or just simply a place where you can enjoy some open space. So consider the corners. Perhaps here, perhaps over here, which raises the next question, shade. Do you want shade in your yard? And if so, how much? Consider, and this is very, very important, where your house is located in the lot relative to the sun. If this is south, then you've got a real hot wall right here. Consider whether or not you want to cool it down. And if you do, put vines on your list as something that you want to use in your landscape. Okay, the next thing you want to do is use a lot of curved lines. And you've probably noticed, if you're looking around your neighborhood, that landscape designers tend to do a lot of this. And there's a good reason for that. And I'd like to get to that right now as we concentrate on the front yard. So let's take a look at the elevation of the front of your home. And you'll notice it too, just like the plot plan, is very cube shaped. A lot of straight lines, all right? Let's put a fire in the fireplace, why not? It's a lovely warm place to be. And here is your garage and the driveway. All right, so something about a home that I think is particularly unfriendly until it becomes landscape. That, by the way, is your garage, all right? And that's the front door of your home. Now, let's get back to curbs, all right? 
This is very important to understand, that if you put something like this at the front of your home, which is a nice curved bed, which you're probably going to fill with evergreens. You've noticed that junipers, cedars, mugo pine, and euonymus are, are used in Canadian landscapes pretty consistently coast to coast. And the reason for that is that it provides something visual, something really exciting all year round, even during the cold Canadian winter, there are no leaves dropping off and the naked skeletons of plants exposed and exposing your house for what it really is, which is a cube, right? So that's why evergreens are being used so much in home landscapes. And of course, the type of evergreens you use is not something I can get into right now. But what I can do is suggest that if you take, if you take these curved lines and you can play with these not just on a piece of paper, but if it's the time of year where you can get out of doors, then take a garden hose and place it on the ground in such a way that you can see where the garden bed can be cut. Turn it and change it until you're happy with it. And make sure, of course, that you've got somebody out there with you whose opinion is important to you. That could be a wife or a husband or a partner or a kid, but make sure that you've got that other opinion before you actually cut the sod out and you create this new bed. That shade tree, whatever you do, don't put it in the middle of the yard. Otherwise, you know what happens? This. You end up with a house that looks like it's inhabited by a bunch of people who really have a privacy thing, who really don't want to be bothered. And that's not the point. Your home should be the kind of home that makes you feel good when you come home to it. And also, it should be a place that when neighbors or friends come to visit, they feel welcome there. And you can accomplish much of that by adding color to your landscape. So consider perennials, flowering shrubs, for permanent color, reliable color that comes back year after year. Lilacs, peonies, lilies, the list is almost endless, in addition to those evergreens. So the evergreens, absolutely, have a few in there because of their permanent nature. Add the color because it warms up your house through the gardening season, and of course you want to use annual flowering plants. Petunias, the most important or most popular annual of all times, of course, is the impatience in sunny or in shady places. That's in shady places. So back to the shade tree for just a moment. Not in the middle of your yard, but in the corner of your yard here. And what it should do is it should provide a canopy, a canopy of shade over that corner of the yard or even over the corner of the house where you'd like to have that shade. And in time, it will grow up and it will frame the house, even when it's not in full leaf during the growing season, it will frame the house and provide something that is otherwise missing. I mean, really missing. If you drive through a new subdivision, for instance, it doesn't matter what they plant, that young plant material never quite does it. It never quite warms up a community, or I should say, turns a row of houses into what really feels like a community the way the mature uh, areas in your town do feel. And that's because of trees. Substantially, it's because of trees. Down one side, just to balance, and that's another key thing here. In a landscape design, there should always be some balance. A shade tree on one side of the yard calls for some small dwarf trees down the other side of the driveway. Now, these dwarf trees could be flowering trees, adding a little bit of variety right throughout the year. Early spring flowering crab apples or flowering almonds, for instance, are absolutely perfect. Very, very hardy in most regions in Canada, and they're absolutely perfect down that opposite side of the driveway, giving your house, once again, balance. I want to tell you one more thing about vines. Not only do they cool them down, not only does it cool down the wall of the house, but it also adds some color, even if it's green. Green is a color it adds some color through the growing season. And if you really want to try an exciting vine that not only provides you with that color and that insulation through the summer months, try Euonymus, which is a broad-leafed evergreen. It's an evergreen that holds its, needle, its, its leaves right through the winter, and it looks absolutely gorgeous. Well, what I may have now is a bit of a mess, but I hope you've got a few tips here that will help you on your journey towards that beautiful landscape that you've dreamed about. First thing you want to do is determine what shape the bed should take. You might take the garden hose out of the garage, place it on the top of the sod or in the top of the lawn area, and look at it very carefully. You might involve some members of the family in this decision. 
And once you've got the garden hose in such a configuration that you know you're going to be happy with the bed in that shape, then you take a good, sharp garden variety spade, which, by the way, you've sharpened up using a good metal file. Really important to start with a good, sharp spade in the first place. It makes the job easy. Now, once you've established the shape, take the spade, place it on the sod, and you're going to have to jump right on top of it, give it the full weight of your body to cut through the sod, which probably has been there for a number of years. Just like that. Now, we're going to go all along here, creating the shape of the bed by cutting it with this spade, and then we're going to turn this, we're going to take the sod, shave it off, and put it to one side. So I've shaved the sod off this whole area to a depth of about three inches. The point is you want to remove the sod, including the feeding roots, at one time. I'll explain why further in just a minute. Now, you want to dig the bed down to the full depth of the spade, just like so. Make sure you use a long-handled spade, or you can use a shovel for this job here. Just toss it to the other side of the bed. Now, I should just warn you of one thing here, and that is that we happen to have pretty nice soil here, even though it's never been dug before. You might find, if you've got solid clay in your yard, that you'll have to use a pickaxe to cut through it. We've dug the bed down to the full depth of a spade or the shovel, the 8 to 10 inches, and now we're backfilling by taking the sod and turning it upside down in the bottom of the hole. It's going to compost there very nicely over time. Now the fun part begins. We're going to take the soil that we dug out and we're going to put it back into the hole, one shovel at a time, of course, unless you've got a back hole. And as you go, you want to add two key ingredients, peat moss, and composted cattle manure, which can be substituted with finished compost from your own composter. So let's just do that, and let me explain something very important. For an area 10 by 10 for 100 square feet, one large bale of peat moss, and three 50-pound bags of cattle manure. Now you've made a special effort to prepare the soil, let me remind you of one thing. 90% of the success you enjoy in your garden will come from the work that you invest in your soil. Now time for planting. We're going to fill this bed up with some color. I'm using an annual dianthus right here, along with some impatience, which will thrive over the next while. Put them in the well-prepared hole and put the soil around it and firm it down. Really give it some oomph. Get in there, and what you want to do is get the root mass of the plant in firm contact with that soil so that the plant knows it's time to make a new home. That means make new roots. Once it's planted, you want to take 515-5 transplanter fertilizer, add it to water according to the directions, and then water it right in. For the balance of the summer, you want to make sure that you fertilize all of your annual flowering plants with a good water-soluble fertilizer like 15 30, 15. This miracle grow is just perfect. One of the really fun things to do once you've established your perennial garden, and I can say this because it's only been the last two or three years that I've been able to do this, is you start to get flowers that you can snip off, put in a bucket, bring in the house, and enjoy them not only in your backyard and front yard, but in the house as well. And Mark right. Collins here That's right. to tell us how to do it. That's right. Because there are some tips. Yep. And uh, we've collected a few already, and we're, we're still collecting some. Well, that's right. We've got some rudbeckia. We're in the perennial border, but this is not to say that you can only prune or cut perennials. You can cut your flowering shrubs. You can cut greens off your evergreens, like your cedars or your taxis, your yews. It doesn't matter. And, of course, your annual flowers. Many annual flowers that make great cut flowers. Let's start, for instance, down here. We've got some rudbeckia. We'll cut some of this. We'll put that in a bucket. Excuse me. Here we are, Dan. I'll just hand that I, to I you. Let's move over here and we'll get some uh, purple coneflower. This is a oh, famous Canadian plant. Indians love this stuff, you know, long before we came along. And uh, there we are, purple coneflower. It's an absolutely gorgeous thing that really lasts, and you can dry it as well. And over here, finally, I want to talk about Shasta daisy, such a reliable perennial in the garden. These are not at their peak. They're actually about a week off their peak, but 
there's still some flowers in here we could we're cut and add. a week after the peak here, huh? A week after the peak. We're on the That's downside. Right. We're on the downside. <laughs> Much like Mark and myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you could speak for yourself, my friend. Now, all right, now we've snipped a few flowers, and that looks yeah. easy enough. And we've got lots more. But but there are things, to, uh, you were telling me the time of day is important? Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, if you can do this in the morning, say, before Canada AM, that'd be good. Ah, that'd be <laughs> all right. Good. Or in the evening, of course, when the air is still, but more to the point, when the plant sugars have kind of retreated back to the plant. In the heat of the day, the, 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 the plants are under enough stress under the heat of the sun with almost all flowers, the exception being roses. Roses like to be cut in the middle of the day. All other flowers, I would say, early or late, all right? Mm. Always cut the stem on an angle, and I'll explain why when we get indoors in just a minute. Why? I'll explain why when we get indoors in just a minute. Well, uh, you've piqued my curiosity <laughs> Well, uh, stay piqued, my friend. We're going to go indoors. <laughs> uh, all right. And, and all right. water. Oh, uh, just any water. old water you no, throw I'm glad in? you asked. It this should is... be warm, all right? It should be heavy. You should put like three or four inches in the bottom of the, of the pail and take the pail with warm water that's just lukewarm, not hot water, out into the garden with you. So when you cut, you plunge them directly into the water right away. Don't gather an armful and take them to the water. Gather them a couple of stems at a time and plunge them as you go, okay? Okay, and then once you got them in the bucket, it's time to go into the house and away that's we right. go, right? Let's go, my friend. So I think for a lot of folks, the empty vase is pretty intimidating. Uh, where do you start? Well, you start with a foundation, like building a house, only not quite, only from the beginning. Huh? Green goes in first, and you notice I kind of weave them four or five together, nice long stem. You might even strip the foliage off the bottom half if you find the vase is filling up too quickly. I like a nice broad mouth to my vase, by the way, when I get going with this thing. Um, now, fill it with the foundation, then that's just greens, can be greens of any kind, use your imagination. Then the tall stuff, get in there with some glads, uh, gladiolus that is, get in also with some larkspur or annual, biennial uh, delphinium. Uh, also <clears throat> available for gardens, loves the sun, gerbera, the coneflower that we just cut out of the garden, and more. Let's get to Liatris, for instance, this fantastic perennial which is reliably hardy in most parts of Canada. Just grow it in some sunshine. You'll have no problem with it whatsoever. Okay, how do we finish this guy? Okay, out then we finally we put in a little bit of this, which is one of my favorites. This is uh, Cosmos, all right? And it's one of several different varieties that you can put in, um, as well as a stilby. Did I happen to mention a stilby? I know I've got a little in the arrangement you, at this stage. You, you haven't mentioned yet why we have to cut on the diagonal. Oh, we have to cut on the <laughs> diagonal to, you're right, uh, to uh, expose as much of the flower stem as possible. And the more it's exposed, then the better the flower's ability to suck up water. Oh, the and by the way, will stay vibrant. Yeah, that's right. You want to make sure, too, that you recut when you come indoors, folks. You cut them once when you're outdoors, plunge them into a bucket full of warm water, tepid water, bring them indoors, recut them again. Also, Dan, this is important. You want to make sure. Why don't you just keep going here? I think you've got the idea. Well, well I explained another I couple of things. Now, you don't, I don't have you, any idea. You don't, you, don't, you don't have time here for me to just explain. This is all we have time for is for me to explain that you change the water every day, and if you're really ambitious about this, you'll take the arrangement, put it in a cool part of the house during the nighttime, all right, before you go to bed into a fridge. That's really? great. Just move some of the beer aside. <laughs> and... and Finally, recut from time to time as well and replenish this thing. Some of these flowers will last real well and others won't last so long. So, final, final touch, you've got the idea. I knew uh, you really don't need me at all. The baby's <laughs> breath. We got this fresh out of the garden and that's the Mark finishing touch. Yeah. I grow my own baby's breath. Yeah, you bet. It's now, a cinch. Is it small twigs? Like, would you break off? Well, no, you know what I do? Short, I take short. it like that and I, and I just take my the finger whole thing? and I just shove it jam it in all there. right and that's not florist talk by the way just yeah. shove it into the water and away you go i am not a florist but i love cut flowers indoors okay. all summer long Ta -da! not bad for like two geeks from the summer. even we <laughs> can do it <laughs> Here we are, knee-deep in begonias at Cullen Gardens with our old buddy Mark Cullen. Nice to see you again, Mark. Hi, Dan. We are also in the shade, as you may have noticed, because today we're going to talk about uh, plants that flourish in the shade. That's right. Now, begonias, everyone knows about begonias in patience. Well, just about everybody does. Yeah, that's right. But one thing you know for certain is that they die with a frost, so they're mm -hmm. a great spring-planted plant. But this is the time of year really do a lot of landscaping with permanent nursery stock that is hardy, of course. You can plant now, it'll make it through the winter very nicely and come back next year. And in the shade, there's a whole family of yews. Have you seen these before? You yeah, I actually have a couple of these myself. 
Well, use, as you may know, that's the common name, Y-E-W, by the way, not, y not Y-O-U, um, <laughs> yes. as in I-O. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with that. Taxes, sometimes called taxes. Uh, the U family is huge. And what we're looking at here is a small Japanese upright U, which is great because it prunes, it prunes so nicely and it's very versatile. Sun or shade, holds, all the U. Holds yeah. the shape. There's a globe U in front of us, and if you want a lovely U for a hedge, try Hicks U. H-I-C-K-S. Use, easy. Yeah. Now, over here we've got uh, hydrangea. hydrangea. Good well, let's, let's go take a look. Yep, great in the shade. Let's do that. And Dan, there's one more thing about the Japanese U's and all the members of the U's, U family I wanted to tell you is that they don't like wet feet. And that's why they're so perfect for foundation plantings under the soffit or the eave of your house. So you want to keep them dry. Well, now, what about yep. the hydrangea? Uh, do they, the, are they as fussy? No, not at all. But this is Annabelle hydrangea. Yeah, it's a wonderful, pretty, huh? really hardy plant. Yeah, and there's just a couple secrets to growing these things successfully. In the shade, really, they're best in the shade. Mm -hmm. They like the protection. They like the coolness. And these do like a somewhat damp soil. Shade? Perfect. Perfect. What if about you drive the through, sun? If you drive through small town Ontario or Quebec or any part of Canada where they have old gardens that go back about a century, you always find this plant somewhere in that town because it's a, it's a great turn-of-the-century plant. Uh, it's also a member of a large family, the hydrangea family, which is substantially frost-resistant and hardy, okay? <laughs> but some of them are, some of them aren't. You have to ask, depending on where you live, at your local uh, garden center or retailer. PG hydrangea is one. You know the one with the, the long, elongated lilac-shaped flowers? Oh, yeah. White like this? Great in the shade. And, and now is a good time to plant. And now is a good time to plant. Now we got a couple more exotic guys over here. That's right, but not so fast. One thing you should know <laughs> about these plants: let them drop their leaves and leave them for the winter, just as they stand. But in the spring, cut them back to about three inches high. Aggressively cut them right back to about three inches in, high. In the spring. And they bounce back like these were cut back last spring. And look how high they are wow. now. Yeah. If well, you I'm don't. I'm about six and a half feet tall. So. <laughs> Come, let's go dreams, see these other ones over here. All right, let's go. Now, in this case, I'm not providing all the shade, but I'm helping, Mark. No. Uh, what are these gorgeous things? Well, this is heuchera, or some people call it coral bells, and it's, it's another member of a larger family. This particular one has a beautiful purple leaf, as you can see, and it's mm -hmm. wonderful in the shade. Not quite full shade, but I would say three-quarters of a day of shade, no problem. It works real well, and as you can see here, makes a great border plant, a real hardy perennial that'll come back year after year. And one of the great bonuses of this plant, Dan, is the fact that it blooms like this mm -hmm. from about the middle of June right through to the middle of September for a long, long time, unlike most perennial plants. Great in the shade. Sometimes called coral bells, you'll find this bloom in an orange or a red with green leaves often at the it's garden center. It's got the spectacular under, underneath part of the leaf too, which is... Uh... Yeah, you like that? Yeah, really. Yeah, the color is nice uh, furry. But you know what else I like here? No. Which, which really caught my action. If you can look up here, just over our shoulders, it looks like you're in the Amazon jungle or something. Uh, that's true. What are these things? Well, that's castor bean. It's like castor oil, C-A-S-T-E-R. E-R? E-R-O-R. And I don't know. How, how many years does it take to get this tall? That's an annual plant. That thing, <laughs> I mean, what they do, actually, you know, no. hockey sticks are made out of these things. Right, that's true. Most hockey sticks are made out of castor bean. I'm kidding you, of course. <laughs> They're made out of ash. The castor bean grows so tall that you could make a walking stick out of it Trying at the end of the year. Of me, <laughs> no, it's a wonderful <laughs> plant that grows that big in one year. But remember this, folks, it's got poisonous seeds. So be careful with it. If you've got uh -huh. kids around, grow it, but remove the flowers from the plant as they're produced, just so it doesn't go to seed. Cutting tools. Looking forward to this one. Morning, Mark. Uh, hi, Dad. <laughs> nice to see that you again. That doesn't mean we're not going to put you to work, you know. Ah, darn. <laughs> Actually, I just kind of like, it's kind of a macho thing, all this stuff, you know, these... Prune, this is a pruning saw, right? It's a pruning saw. Yeah, don't use a crosscut, okay, guys? Don't go down into the workshop and use the crosscut. Buy yourself one of these. It's not that expensive, you know. And it, the difference is that it cuts both ways. Sometimes these are referred to as green wood saws. But we're going to get to that in a minute. I don't need okay. one right now because I'm pruning the cedar. What would you call that? A snippers? Snippers. Hand pruners to Hand some. Hand pruners. And to my dad, they're seconders. You know, I don't. I think that's an old British. Is that like a non sequitur? <laughs> <laughs> this would be a non sequitur. This guy here. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. Uh, th these. I would call these uh, pruners, pruners. Hedge, hedge pruners, 
Hedge uh, clippers. Hedge clippers. That's good. Today okay. we're doing pruning. And uh, right. now a lot of folks have cedar. Uh, and they do get yeah, a little unruly. That's right. Well, you know, cedar grow from coast to coast. You can be New Newfoundland oh, right out to uh, British Columbia, where they're probably pruning right now because as fast as you prune cedars in British Columbia, they, they just grow. Keep growing. They grow. You finish at one end, and then you got to start the other. So the thing about cedars that's interesting, and I think worth noting, is that they grow consistently from the beginning to the end of the season, more or less. Unlike most evergreens, which spurt. So you can, you can do it any time you want. Any time. Any time. That's can why we, uh, I was working when you were talking. Can we make this one look like a duck? <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could. You can make it look like anything if you like, actually. Um, but the question I think most people like to ask is when, and I think the answer is for cedars, any time in the growing season, even in the middle of winter. I mean, if you're inclined, you could prune really? them in the middle of winter. Do they grow all winter? No. <laughs> I don't know why you'd prune it in the winter, but you could prune it in the winter. <laughs> all right? Okay. Um, but for shape, you know, people want to know, why would you prune, why do, should you prune a cedar? Generally for shape, so you don't need the hand pruners that you've got right mm. here. Hang on to those for a minute, and you just simply give it some shape by simply doing this. But it's important, Dan, that you do this every year. You know why? No. Because if you don't, they get woody, and if they get woody, this becomes one heck oh. of a job. Yeah. Get this Careful. guy out. He's going to lose a couple <laughs> fingers for sure, really. Well, look, we, we should probably move on. Yeah, uh, what we else should. we got here? Okay. Prune for shape. This is a high bush cranberry. It's a really hardy shrub. It attracts birds. It gets real nice red berries on it. They don't eat them. They're just attracted to them. Nice green, too. It's nice green right now. And uh, I prune the high bush cranberry once every two years. Uh, and when I do, if you don't mind, I'll just Certainly. borrow these. If Certainly. you could just hang on to those. You prune, first of all, you thin it, all right? Unlike the cedar, or junipers for that matter, you want to thin flowering shrubs and not give them a bowl cut, you know? When you're a kid, your mom yeah. put a bowl on and then cut your hair. The right. bowl cut's the Don't easy one that. to do. That's the easy you one. To do. You could. This one. <laughs> you could take this guy and just cut off all the loose ends. Reach down into the middle of the plant and pull out, Whoa. cut out about a third, about a third of the plant at a time, all right? Wow, so that's you a reach, big chunk. Dan, you get right down in there and you prune it out. Now, you might ask, why? Why? Because, I'm glad you asked, <laughs> because, because you want the sun to filter down into the middle of the shrub and you want the air to circulate through. Why? Because that helps to encourage new growth down in the middle. Now, if you give it a bowl cut, and you've all seen this happen, all right, mm -hmm. your neighbor probably cuts his shrubs that way or her shrubs that way, you're not going to do that. If you look at a shrub that's been bowl cut, you pull that foliage apart, what do you see down in the middle? Wood. Wood. No mm -hmm. leaves at all. None. So you want to encourage growth so down in the middle. So on top, thin on the bottom. That's right. So you've given it a nice thinning by removing one third of the wood every two years for most flowering shrubs. Lilacs, purple sand cherry, uh, Russian olive, you know, the list mm -hmm. goes on and on and on. Then after you've done that, it's still a little bit unruly. You need to keep it under control, and that's where these come in. So this is, Dan, this is discipline <clears throat> for plants. It's a little bit like kids. <laughs> and you have to, you just have to make the plant understand who's in charge. You're in control. Make sure that the plant understands that. When do we get to use this? Right now, we're going to go cut a limb. A and limb. I'm going to put you to work Th out that this way. This way? Yeah, I've got to find a tree. Hey, it's starting to drizzle, Mark. So, uh, yeah, let's, so get, let's get to work. Let's get underneath this up here. tree here. And uh, this is a lovely uh, Norway maple. It's it, beautiful. Uh, yeah, I, I give it a little bit of thinning every couple of years. And right in here, let's take a look at this limb here, all right? This is really very this simple. This is my job? Yeah. Once again, a pruning saw or a green wood saw, not the saw from the basement. Really important. Out here, now, in here? No, no, no. You want to come right in here. But before you take your cut from the top down, score the bark on the underside. So flip this around. Like about here? Yep. Yeah, yeah. And score it. Go back and forth two or three times. <laughs> Perfect. Whoa, 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 whoa. OK. Now, around to the top. And cut on an angle All so right, it's kind of flat. Perfect. That's right. That's How long right. do I have go. to do this? Come on, go. <laughs> work, work. That's good. Now, the reason he scored the bark, folks, is so that ah. the bark didn't strip all the way down the main trunk of the tree. That's all there is to it. Isn't that beautiful? That's nice and clean. I think you could go in the business, really. I think you've got, there's some <laughs> hidden talent here, folks, that we weren't aware of before. <laughs> Sorry, pal. <laughs> well, thanks again, Mark. More wonderful tips, as always. Today, Mark, we're going to talk about putting some color in your fall garden because, right. I mean, let's face it, the perennials are starting to look a little tired at this time of year, and you can't put annuals in because of frost at night. That's right. So we're going to start by planting fall asters. Uh, why asters? Well, these, these plants bloom right through the hard frost of, of early, late fall, depending on where you live in Canada. 
So they're going to bloom right through until the end of October. That's why asters. You don't have to put up with a garden that's colorless when the when the leaves are finished or when the flowers are finished. Uh, are you going to crack that open? I, we I need see, some I new see, soil for I this. I see day. we've already dug a hole. Yeah. This is Dan this working. Stuff? You don't get to see this every morning on Canada AM. Oh. All right. <laughs> Very good. Now, this is don't, the super rich stuff. Don't in sprinkle it? it. This is like a triple mix, really. It's compost and, and topsoil mixed together. We call it grow mix. All right? And you need this. This is essential, absolutely essential for success when you're planting anything. Plant it in good soil. All right? Take your aster, flip it upside down, pop it out of the pot. That's a nice plant, lots of fibrous roots. Okay, Dan, come on down here. Uh, wait a minute, you're not going to upset the uh, roots, are you? You're not going to... No, 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 scarify the roots? Scarify. No, no, that's for house plants. Come here. Wait, why, why? Wait, just push this, push this soil in around the plant. All right. Down, all right? I, I, and I'll firm it down. You could get dirty doing this. <laughs> I was thinking... Idea. That's the I... joy of it, my friend. You can't do this in the winter in Canada. Not to this extent, anyway. See, I got another job. Yeah, I'll... put a little oomph in it with your, with your boot, with your shoe, all right? And get the soil well packed down around the root zone. Now, what about that transplant fertilizer stuff? Yeah. Is, is that the good stuff to use? Absolutely. 515.5. This stuff has butyric acid in it. Helps to encourage young feeding roots. Makes all the difference. The second one being? Phosphorus. Phosphorus. So that's High the phosphorus. key one at this time of year? 515.5. Just... This time. No, any time you're planting. Anything. You want those young roots to get established. A couple other plants, Dan, that are great for fall planting. Here, let's call this one out too, because this one is a great surprise to people. Looks like a vegetable. It is, but I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> You've got another one. <clears throat> this is uh, flowering kale, sometimes called flowering cabbage. Yours will turn more yellow as it gets exposed to frost. Oh, some, something like this? No, no. Get out of here with that. <laughs> no, it's going to be a nice yellow. <laughs> Gee, where'd you get that thing? I don't know. And this is going to turn purple. Now, these actually improve with killing frost and will look their best about the first week of December if they're not co absolutely covered in snow. They look their best just before Christmas. Huh. So flowering kale, flowering cabbage. I just want to show you one other thing. And this is a member of the same family with a lace leaf. All right, for just a slightly different effect. What's this one called? Uh, flowering kale. Oh, okay. It's same just family. A cousin, huh? it's, it's, it's a cousin with a lace leaf. Isn't that fabulous? Beautiful. And you can, you can plant these in mass at the front of your house or wherever you like and get color when most of your neighbors probably assumed that the garden had to be put to bed. Yeah. Which it did. Well, a lot of it looks that way. That's, that's for sure. Okay, chrysanthemums. We haven't talked about chrysanthemums. You want to haul out a nice yellow one there. Mm. These are in full bud right now. And they're going to be absolutely gorgeous plants, just about the time the impatience die down in your garden. Which will These be are the first frost, won't it? Yeah, yeah, first week of October where they you just live. just lie down and die. That's right. But these will break bud. They'll break out into full flower about the first, second week of October, continue to bloom for another five to six weeks. So what do we do? We just space them out as if they were uh, annuals in the spring? Well, sort of. Nope. We'll place uh, aster, aster, and three cabbage. How about that? Perp. Now, we plant these all, just exactly the same way with rich just, soil, tamp them down really firm. That's and right. And then apply, them really well. water them well with a transplanter fertilizer, the liquid that you uh, mix with water. So we're halfway there in our planting. We just thought we'd take a moment maybe to really water in and fertilize the ones that we've already put in the ground. But Mark, as we're finishing up this garden, maybe you can just tell the folks at home if they miss it the first time, the three major plants for right. fall. fall. Chrysanthemums, hardy chrysanthemums, not the florist mums you buy mm -hmm. in a flower shop, but the hardy ones you buy in the garden center. Fall flowering asters and flowering kale or cabbage. Well, right. why don't you water and fertilize? All right. And thanks a lot. Yeah. Always a pleasure. Always learn something new. I'll start digging over Me here. Me too. Thanks, and folks, man. Look at how much color and freshness has been added to this garden. Spectacular stuff, Mark. Uh, this is the time of the year where you can plant some stuff that you won't see this year, but uh, will bear great fruit in the spring. And uh, some of the stuff is really spectacular looking. And Mark Collins here today to tell us about some of the bulbs that you can plant now that aren't daffodils and uh, what's the other one? Tulips. Tulips. Those, Tulips, yeah. They're the ones that yeah. I plant. You're going to learn a lot. <laughs> I think you're going to learn a lot. Uh, these yeah. are some exotics here. Well, as a matter of fact, you could call them exotics. This one that you picked up, for instance, fr Fritillaria. Fritillaria is a wonderful family of bulbs. Here's another. You might want to just hang on to that for All me, right. Dan. The smaller type, a larger type here. Wonderful plants for not only their beautiful <laughs> bl bloom in the spring, 
but also because they deter moles. They look like limp tulips, these guys. They look like limp tulips, but they bloom a lot longer, and they're actually like little coral bells, you know? They kind of hang, yeah. only they're not coral at all. They have that kind of leopard skin look. Are these large, You know, the leopard way, skin's small? very expensive, isn't it? These are very small, what you have in your hands. They mm -hmm. only grow about eight inches high, and this one that I have in my hand will grow three feet, so it'll get quite large. Oh, yeah. So like Take I said, here's another one, a yellow. Now, did you hear what I said about them deterring uh, Mole. rodents, yeah. moles, mice, rats, raccoons, even skunks. And the reason is that they actually smell a bit like a skunk. That oh. is, the bulb does. Not the flower, the bulb. But once it's buried in the ground, Dan, you don't smell them at all. This kind of has a daffodil yellow to it, huh? Yes, it does. So does yours. <laughs> this is a daffodil. <laughs> this is actually a little dwarf narcissus. All right, we're moving on from there. We're going to talk about little dwarf narcissus. Isn't that a pretty little thing? Very pretty. Yeah, otherwise minute, called, have yeah. you heard of jonquils? You get about six bulbs for four bucks. Well, that's right, but they're specialized bulbs. The Dutch are doing an excellent job of kind of expanding our minds and the possibilities in our gardens for color in the spring. You can count on these small bulbs, these minor bulbs, to bloom early. They're really, really hardy, and some of them actually go right back to the origins of the bulb, which was in Turkey over 400 years ago. No what you're holding in your hand, for instance, is a Turkish bulb, and it's a tulip. The tulip started in Turkey in the foothills of the mountains there. And this and is tiny as well, only gets up very, to six inches high? Oh, very tiny. And they come back year after year, extra early bulbs. As soon as the frost is out of the ground, they really look great. Just look at these. Aren't they neat? Now, what are they? These look like daffodils, but again, they're... No, that's, again, that's, that's, um, that's uh, another type of uh, tulip. All right, wow. you with me? Yeah, All right, yeah. now, yeah, this is a little crocus. Look at the stripe in that wow. crocus. You just don't see those every day. And that's, that's what I mean about different. You're getting this out of Holland now, which we, we didn't so many, so many years ago. It was the typical tulip and daffodil, and this only goes four inches high? You right. don't think it's that high? Right. So Plant it by your front tiny, door. Huh? Put it in containers if you're in an apartment or a condominium and put them outdoors for the winter. They'll survive quite nicely. Just keep them wet through mm -hmm. the winter. And uh, if you're in a house, then plant these near the front door so that as you come to work early in the spring, you've had it with winter at that stage, these <laughs> greet you at the front door. And they're wonderful. Yeah. Try some hyacinth for the same reason. So a novelty bulb for the kids. Look at that. You know what that is? No. It's an onion. But it's not a garden what? variety onion. It's an allium. It's an allium giganteum, or hardy, giant, ornamental onion. And it's a beaut. It's also a family. You know how chives look when they're in full bloom? Excuse me. Sure, bless you. <coughs> here's, it's here's an onion, a, huh? Here's a, it's supposed here's, to make you cry. Yeah, we haven't cut it yet. Don't cut it. Plant it. Plant bulbs three times as deep as the bulb is thick, as a, as a general rule of thumb, by the way. Another onion and... Uh, it's just a, a shorter... Does, this looks like chives. A shorter flowers. variety, the same thing. Chives are a member of the onion family. Also, for color, anemones, people have a hard oh, time. they're beautiful. Yeah, aren't they gorgeous? Yeah, and here's one of my favorite. This is, uh, this is co sometimes called foxtail lily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can and ask for it. It's foxtail lily. No, it's not a true lily. But when this blooms in my front yard, people walk off the street and they <laughs> say to me, what is that thing? <laughs> like, they've never seen anything quite like it. Foxtail lily, it's how, really how tall does it grow? Oh, it'll grow six feet tall. Yikes! But really hardy. Any part of Canada, save except maybe the Arctic Circle, these things grow just fine. So minor bulbs and different bulbs now available from Holland. I should tell you one other thing, and this is just between you and me. You've got to get in there. You've got to get in there soon to the garden center to buy these things <laughs> because there's only one, only one boat comes from Holland, and when they're gone, they're gone. Oh. They don't go so back that's a, for more. That's a good tip. That's not blatant self-promotion. No, it's not. It's <laughs> wherever you buy your bulbs, do it and do it soon. I hope you enjoyed the information in this tape on color and design in the garden. And remember, there's lots more information in the companion book. Thanks a lot for joining me.